Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the first session to introduce the draft implementation plan for the Ocean Decade. I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and I hope you're all well. And I'm very pleased to let you know that we have more than 400 people who have registered for this webinar. Um, and you'll see people are still signing on. If you know anyone um, that is having trouble, please ask them to look in their spam folder for the link. In addition, we're having a second session that will be identical to this first session. We're holding that on Thursday. We have more than 250 people who registered for that session. My name is Linwood Pendleton. I'm a member of the Executive Planning Group, the EPG, that was established as an advisory board to support the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission with the preparatory phase of the decade. And I'm very pleased to be your moderator for today's session. For the last year and a half, many of you have been actively involved in the preparatory phase for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And you've participated in a number of workshops, meetings, and events. And now we're approaching the final steps of this process. Today, we wanna to present to you the implementation plan for the Ocean Decade and give you a chance to ask questions about the proposed framework to achieve the decade's vision and objectives. These two remote sessions were put forward following the cancellation of the second global planning meeting due to the current coronavirus outbreak. It's not meant to replace the full scope of what we were aiming to achieve during the three-day face-to-face in Paris, but rather to focus on completing the consultation process required to finalize the implementation plan. In addition to these remote meetings, the Decade team is developing alternate plans that will unroll over the course of the year. And all the information about this will be shared through the normal Decade communications channels. We have a very busy agenda today. Slide two, please. And I want to introduce you to my co-presenters. Thank you. We have with us Vladimir Ryabinin, who is the IOC Executive Secretary, Martin Visbeck and Craig McLean, both members of our EPG, Guillermo Ortuño, a member of the Early Career Ocean Professional Community, and finally, Alison Clausen from the IOC Secretariat in the Marine Policy and Regional Coordination Unit. The agenda today is divided into five segments, but overall it'll follow the structure of the implementation plan, which you had access to through a link we shared with you after you completed your registration. Before we get started, there are a few logistical details I wanna pass along to you. As a participant, you are automatically muted for the duration of the webinar. However, you're invited to share your questions by typing them into the questions box. Starting right away, some questions will be asked throughout the sessions and others will be held for the end of the presentation but I encourage you to add your questions as soon as they occur to you and don't wait to hold them till the end. We recognize that we won't have time to answer all the questions, but rest assured that this session is about you and all your questions will be carefully reviewed and taken into consideration as we complete the final review process for the implementation plan. This PowerPoint presentation, as well as a recording of the session, will be made available on the Decade website later this week. After the session, you'll receive a follow-up email with all the details about how to access these materials. Now, I wanna introduce you to Vladimir Ryabinin to share with us the latest update on the preparatory phase, as well as to present his vision for the decade. Thank so it's over to you, Vladimir. Thank you very much, Linwood, and uh, hello, everyone. So like Linwood, I hope uh, very much that we will soon overcome the coronavirus, uh, which is the real um, near-term priority for the world, and then as soon as we have done so, the issues of long-term sustainability, including ocean, will be again back uh, to the radar screen. Um, the proclamation of the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development um, by the United Nations General Assembly in December 2017 is a major development for oceanography. It means that 195 nations of the world consider ocean science as their priority, as priority for the civilization at the beginning of the third millennium. The role of IUC was to invent uh, an inclusive uh, process that would uh, uh, offer a path to, to the positive answer to the following question. Is there a way to reverse the decline in ocean health, in ocean health and to continue to rely on the ocean for our needs particularly uh, under the climate change. So we tried to involve in this process 
uh, countries, United Nations agencies, science organizations, institutes, private sector, intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, philanthropists, uh, private sector, holders of traditional knowledge, uh, considering and respecting gender and age balance. Uh, have we involved all? No, of course not. But I think we have involved really many. And uh, now when I say we, it is not only RUC, this is the whole community of contributors and kind of shareholders in the, in the decade. So, we also needed leaders and would like to thank uh, the executive planning group. Initially, there were six people on the interim group and 20 thought leaders that really helped us to craft uh, the understanding of what we can achieve and how in and put this in the in the draft implementation plan. There was also a special group of United Nations agencies. I think we managed to achieve global mobilization be behind the decade. So be uh, between May 2019 and this month's March, uh, we, we held global thematic and nine out of 11 plan regional planning uh, meetings for, for the decade. More, more than uh, 1,000 of participants. The meetings were held in the Pacific, uh, three workshops, a workshop in the Indian Ocean, North and South Atlantic, Mediterranean, uh, in the Arctic as well, and also in Africa. In the current situation, we are also planning to additional virtual meetings for the Caribbean and again for the Arctic. I would like also to thank uh, our supporters, Belgium, uh, more precisely the Flanders, Canada, Japan, Norway, Republic of Korea, Sweden, United Kingdom for their direct support uh, for the planning phase of the case. And of course, I would like to thank uh, many partners that became friends in this process that helped us to conduct uh, the preparatory phase. So, especially I would like to underline that there is now a community of the young career ocean professionals. They came together and made a very strong contribution to the planning decade. And one of them is with us now. This is Guillermo Ortunia. Uh, and congratulate you on the recent defense of PhD and would like to give the, uh, the floor to you for your, for your short statement. Please, Guillermo. Thank you very much, Vladimir, uh, and good afternoon from Durham, North Carolina, to everyone online. Um, my name is Guillermo Ortuño Crespo. I'm a core member of the Early Career Ocean Professional, ECOP, informal working group that the IOC established last year in order to address the very important task of making sure that the UN Decade of Ocean Science is a truly intergenerational process, both in the design and implementation phases. I briefly wanted to reiterate the importance of ECOPs in the Ocean Decade, what we have accomplished thus far, and some future. Since the idea of an econ working group was conceived during the first global planning meeting in Copenhagen, we have placed particular emphasis on the importance of achieving demographic, gender, racial, professional, and generational representativity in all of our activities to ensure that everyone is engaged and has equal opportunities to generate, assimilate, and transfer knowledge. Over the last few months, we have placed uh, a particular priority on the following areas of work. We launched a global survey, which actually closes today, where ECOPS identified areas of scientific and capacity development priorities for the ocean decade in the region. Since the launch of the survey, we have received over 1,400 responses from over 100 nations, which provide important information on geographic and demographic variability in the perceived priorities for the decade. We seek to publish the results as a report and a peer review publication later this year. We have also worked to identify existing professional networks which support ECOPS, expanded our core group from five to 43 members, participated in a series of regional and global high-level planning meetings, and have also contributed to the development of the Science Action Plan and provided input for the draft implementation agreement. And on that note, the informal working group has um, contributed to the implementation plan by proposing five areas of engagement for ECOPS which are training, which includes the development of ocean training programs, networking through the development of a UN Decade ECOP network, which connects its existing networks uh, for early careers, Inf an information portal to ensure the engagement and contributions of ECOPs to the decade, a coordination mechanism to provide training activities, capacity building and engagement to all ECOPs, and funding, uh, which will provide critical opportunities to support ECOPs, especially from developing countries, in not only contributing, to, but also benefiting from the decade. Uh, we're very grateful for the support that we have received from the IOC thus far and look forward to continuing 
to work along with IOC uh, and other future potential partners. Thank you very much, Guillermo. That was very impressive. Uh, uh, and now let me move forward also with the uh, with the presentation um, and present to you uh, ideas behind the structure of the draft implementation plan. Well, the plan softly speaks about what needs to be done, very softly speaks about uh, how this can be done, and from outlining of what and how, we also move uh, suggesting some ideas of who has to do what. Plan is a strategic framework within which initiatives at all scales, global, regional, national, and local, uh, can be proposed, developed, and then flourish. Uh, we only need to ensure that they align in the implementation towards the, the vision and mission of the decade. Important for the decade will be data management and engagement. The first will be glue, and the, the second will bring a force and energy. We propose direction for, for their development. Capacity development and transfer of marine technology will need to accompany progress at the cutting edge of research and technological development and also uh, for everyone because no one can be left behind including island states landlocked countries developing countries um, so i would like to state very clearly that the current plan does not contain details of actions that will be taken as a part of the decade these actions will be identified through periodic calls for action however it is very important and we try to ensure this in the plan that the totality of action takes us from the ocean we have to the, uh, to the ocean we want. So next slide, please. So in the current state of development, uh, ocean science is competent for diagnosing the problems, and we know there are many. The capacity of science to offer systematic solutions to issues of sustainability needs a massive upgrade. For that, we anticipate two processes. Firstly, building science capacity and mobilizing scientists. And the second process will be enabling, uh, creating an enabling environment and engaging practitioners, decision makers, and the private sector. Uh, and this pull and this push by the two, two communities should fuse under the decade. And they will form an end-to-end -end value chain. This is a very difficult process to organize, but this is exactly the main idea for the decade. So this transformation of ocean science will be unprecedented. We hope it will start uh, very soon, but we need to start also with what exists, uh, uh, capitalizing on existing initiatives, and particularly in the current circumstances when uh, the, the world will be hit by the coronavirus. But we hope very much with this process, with enabling environment, uh, the, uh, this will uh, help to accelerate the progress and also the processes in under the decade. And this is reflected in the draft vision and mission statement of the decade. So what we are trying to create, now next slide please, is uh, the science we need for the ocean we want. This is a very simple statement that, that actually was really helping us to convince United Nations about uh, the, success, uh, the, the, the importance and success of the decade. But the mission uh, describes the way how we can uh, generate action so through science we need to develop the science and generate uh, this productive science uh, to uh, help uh, to help the, generate the knowledge that will be uh, changing the course of action in the ocean in order to achieve healthy safe and uh, resilient ocean all the six parameters of the ocean that we would like to achieve by the year 2030 and beyond and hopefully earlier than 2030. So what is the sense of this uh, transformational action? This is also an important message. I think that the decade should enable us to start managing the ocean sustainably. And this, the next slide please. And this is exactly what I would like to present to you um, in, in, in a very short while. So how we can uh, uh, manage the ocean? Uh, we need to observe the ocean. We need to cover certain gaps in ocean knowledge, particularly focusing on ecosystems, focusing on disaster risk reduction, focusing on blue economy. Um, and this uh, requires some scientific breakthroughs. And we expect from you proposals on what you can achieve, uh, what you can propose in, 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 in this area. And this will take us to a different level of ability to manage the ocean through maritime special planning, 
through coastal zone management, through establishment of science-based and very effective marine protected areas. The science-based management of the ocean space and resources will strongly contribute to grand challenges of our time, including mitigation of and adaptation to climate change, providing food for people, supporting sustainable blue economy, uh, supporting human health, addressing the loss of biodiversity. And because of that, the decade hopefully will be a catalyst for many partners, helping them to achieve their mandates and uh, uh, fulfill their aspirations. So this is what I would like to say in terms of introduction to the plan. And over to you, Linwood. OK, well, thanks, Vladimir. And, and thank you, Guillermo. The decade is truly a, a once in a lifetime opportunity and our best chance of harnessing science to get the ocean we want. But it's a, it's a big task, and that's why we need a whole decade to do it. So to talk about that now, I'd like to ask Martin Visbeck to walk us through the framework that's going to guide the design and implementation of the science-based actions for the decade. Over to you, Martin. Well, thank you, Lindvit, uh, and thank you, Vladimir, for uh, terrifically introducing the overall objective and aims of the decade. So it's my task to familiarize a little bit more about uh, what we call the action framework, is how we're going to spring your ideas, um, your ambitions, your contributions into global action. And the way we have structured that is uh, by calling it the scientific objectives and orientations. So this decadal action framework will guide the design and implementation of the decade. It is based on this set of scientific objectives and strategic orientations to organize us. And uh, the idea of this is that this structure is following what Vladimir just uh, told us a moment ago, what we call the circular value chain approach. And you see on this slide, I go into a detail in a bit more, uh, this first arrow that talks about the global ocean science capacity and capability and literacy. So it's really building up all the capabilities around the globe that we can better understand, tackle, and uh, suggest actions in this human ocean interface. But more specifically, uh, there is four elements uh, in the value chain that starts. We need to generate more knowledge about the ocean through science, through observations, through various sets of insights which are relevant to the agenda informing on sustainable development and for the society. Second, we need to much more widely understand and deploy that knowledge towards application, towards tools, towards services, towards agenda. This has to do with assessment, forecasting, looking at the future and where we are right now. And last but not least is turn that knowledge into action, into policy decisions, planning processes, uh, different types of activities uh, from the scientific as well as the society as large. And again, these actions then will ask new questions about knowledge, about information and so on. So let me just go now through these uh, four objectives one by one uh, by the next slide. So the next slide introduces you to the first objective, that is to increase the transformative ocean knowledge capacity and capability globally. So this is really about uh, enabling us to understand, predict, forecast, interact, plan, and uh, be part of the ocean system in a much more capable, in a much more intelligent, knowledgeable way around the world. Now you can imagine uh, a couple of orientations or examples of the kind of things uh, we would like to see under this objectives. For example, it's about uh, data systems or information systems which are shared, the information around the world in an equitable uh, way. For example, that data are delivered in a, in a fair principles, meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But it's also to build up the knowledge, the capabilities in general around ocean knowledge. That means the training, capacity building, education, ocean literacy, not just in the scientific domain, but throughout society in various parts of civil society, the private sector, governments, uh, and the scientific community at large. That does include the next generation youth, but also underrepresented uh, minorities uh, and parts of our societies. It is about ocean literacy, it's about training, it's about education. And what we really would like to see is a much more agile, uh, fit for purpose, uh, 
educational system out there that us really allows us to build up the human capabilities and technical capabilities to much better understand and address the ocean system. Next slide. So now we come into the slightly more specific actions uh, in the value chain. Now, given that we have and will develop more capabilities and capacities around the world, then the first objective is to expand, innovate, and integrate ocean knowledge systems globally. So what we mean by that is uh, that this objective relates to the expanding and sustaining the creation of all of knowledge with a strong emphasis on both technology, infrastructure, people, and different types of information systems. One example is, for example, a global ocean observing system that covers all ocean basins from the upper ocean to the deep ocean, from the open ocean right to the coast and where humans interact with the ocean. The second uh, orientation could be uh, to innovate and improve services that use also knowledges that really improve and enable us at the scientific community, but also us as the private sector or the government to better use the data, ocean information that there is uh, in our daily work. It is also about new technologies, new ways in which we can observe, understand, and look into the ocean, which many parts of the world want low-cost sensors, low-cost ways in which we do the observation. So this will help to speed up the knowledge. And in a fourth orientation, again, these are four examples, is to also develop mechanisms and frames to integrate practical knowledge, traditional knowledge, experimental and local knowledge, into our knowledge system. That means they're part of our observing system, they're part of the monitoring that we do, but they also allow us to assess the state of the system and how it is changing in the future. Next slide, please. The third objective is about understanding and predicting the whole ocean system and its components. So here we're really trying to move ahead from just observing what there is, but to actually go to understanding. For example, if you had a map of the ocean, you really want to understand who is there, what and why, and what are the physical, geological, biochemical, uh, biological, and social ecological elements of that as an example. Another example would be to much better understand the role and functioning of the ocean components uh, that would include the ocean ecosystem, the ocean circulation system, the biogeochemical cycles, the role the ocean plays in climate, the role the ocean plays in food, uh, but also the pollution levels or also the important role that the ocean plays, for example, in the shaping our coasts. And the third example could be much more improved forecast system and predictive capabilities uh, that could be for a region, that could be locally, for example, informing us on hazards. You can imagine tsunamis or harmful algae blooms in trends. You see the warmings that we see sometimes rapidly leading to regime shifts. It could be uh, relevant for, for example, opportunities to build wind farms, to build renewable energy systems, but also other ways to get food from the ocean. So again, improve forecast and predictive capabilities under objective number three. Next slide, please. The fourth and last objective uh, in this set of the four objectives is that we use our observations, our understanding, the predictive capabilities to really develop much more integrated assessments and decision support systems that support uh, the transformational processes and be part of our transformational tools and processes towards a more sustainable human ocean interactions. Now, there's many examples uh, that you can imagine. So we list here five strategic orientations. For example, one is to develop the cultural, economic, social, and ecosystem indicators of ocean health that identify thresholds and tipping points. So it's about understanding where the system is moving and where rapid change by coming out our way so we can reform adaptation and mitigation policies. A second orientation could be to develop the, and disseminate analytical tools to predict human and environmental interaction based on multiple structures. Now we understand that the coastal systems, the ecosystems are under stress by a number of different uh, challenges. And the question is, can we better understand the combined challenge of those? The th third orientation is innovative platforms for place-based planning processes, sometimes called marine spatial planning or ecosystem-based planning. 
And here we think uh, that, the, again, the observation, the prediction should inform our planning processes so we can protect part of the ocean system, but also use it in a very smart and sustainable way for new services uh, and functions uh, uh, that support sustainable development, in particular the development part of it, more prosperity out of the ocean for a growing population. The fourth orientation is services for building adaptive responses to hazards uh, that is clearly using the information systems, warning systems, to really make them useful and effective to prepare uh, societies for stresses, to build up resilience and disaster risk reduction capabilities. Many examples that we've seen around the globe where that is really important. It was the end result to increase community resilience for the coastal communities. And last but not least, as an orientation, is a greater scientific engagement and policy processes. So we really want many of you to really put your best foot forward to make your knowledge insights available to the various societal processes in, in science, in the science policy interface, in the science economy interface, in the science governing interface. So it's really a function for co-design, co-production, and co-designing solutions and better ways for the human ocean interface. Next slide. So now that we have uh, these four objectives with their orientations, you might ask yourself, so how can I contribute? How can I be part of the decade? How can my program, my project, my activity, something I want to see happening or I'm part of, become part of the decade? And here is uh, where the decade action hierarchy plays a role. So we are imagining that your contributions could be on four uh, scale levels. At the largest scale, the global scale, would be a decade program, something that fulfills one or more of the decade objectives that Vladimir spoke about. It's a long-lasting activity program, maybe a decade, maybe at least five years, it involves many actors, many countries, many disciplines. It is really one of the flagship activities that we have. In my personal estimate, maybe we're going to have 10, 12 programs under the decade, maybe less than 20. The next level, slightly smaller, uh, maybe a sub-element of a program would be projects. These are more discrete, more focused, shorter duration, maybe more standalone, maybe part of the program that are really trying to change the needle, trying to support that transformation that we want to see. They are much smaller in scope, still interdisciplinary, certainly more than one country, uh, but they are more a mid-sized type of activity that we'd like to see. Second, the third one is an activity uh, that could be a meeting, an outcome, an objective, a smaller activity that you think is a great contribution to the decade. Uh, it's a one-off, standalone activity. It could be a global meeting, a particular policy brief that you have in mind, something that you can see smaller in scale. And the last but not least is a contribution that your community might have available against this agenda uh, that is uh, helping uh, the implementation of the decade it could be a financial contribution, it could be engagement contribution, community building exercise. So you see four types of actions that we are promoting, a global program, decadal projects, sort of more focused and activity, a one-off activity, and a contribution that you might have towards implementation of the whole decade. Next slide. Now you might ask yourself the question, well, how does that going to go forward? And here uh, we have uh, thought about that, uh, that we want to have a decade action endorsement process. So that means if you have a program that you want to have endorsed and want to contribute and showcase under the decade, uh, you will have to propose these actions uh, towards the decade. So there will be a process where we call for these activities and uh, these actions will be looked at. Do they contribute to the decade? Do they accelerate progress towards more sustainability and this transformational change that Vladimir was mentioning? Will they enable the uptake of more science, information, and knowledge in ocean policy, in ocean governance, in this human ocean interactions? And will they make sure that all the data and information and knowledge that you're producing will be openly shared, is accessible, discoverable, trustworthy, I might say, and also deposited? So these are the kinds of activities that you have to declare and articulate so that then uh, the planning group uh, can look at that and the Decadal Act Committee can look at that and give you the stamp of approval and make sure that these actions are multi-country, multi-actor partnerships. They really serve our cap 
capability and capacity development and building, pay a particular role to uh, special groups like the small island development states, which I call large ocean states, but also the least development countries, uh, and also balance across gender, uh, generations, geographic diversity, uh, minorities, and so on, pay a particular role to that, and certainly to integrate all types of knowledge practical knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, as well as scientific knowledge. So you can see there are certain criteria around your activity uh, that will facilitate uh, the endorsement process. And if you feel you have a great activity and the decade committee looks at this and agrees with you, that is the way in which we're gonna put uh, your uh, actions, your ability, your contribution on the map and we'll make it together a grand and global success. So I think, uh, uh, Linwood, this is basically all I wanted to share at the highest level about how to spring the decade into action, how the community can engage with us. And now back to you to maybe one or two questions that already you might have received. Yep, thanks, Martin. And we, we have received um, a number of questions. And, and one of the questions from Denise asks, why experimentation doesn't appear in any of the objectives and how will experimentation fit into the science plan? Yes, so I think that is a good question. Uh, you, could tell, you could call it experimentation, you could call it discovery, you can tell it's uh, the more fundamental scientific action. And I think on the one hand, uh, we highly encourage that. Obviously, ocean science is highly innovative. There's a lot of experimentation going on. We have yet to discover much of the ocean. So that is by no means discouraged. But I think this decade of ocean science for sustainable development focuses on those parts of the sciences that have direct relevance and impact on that transformative. And experimentation, you could see in two ways. On the one hand, if you feel experimentation was mentioned in the terms of how can we bring new, new partnerships together to experiment about uh, transdisciplinary science, that is obviously fully in. We want this to be a self-learning processes, uh, communities that learn from each other and with each other. But the more discovery part of science, the experimentation in the more fundamental level, that is maybe something that other organizations would put more to the fore. Here we're looking of that type of science that really supports sustainable development. Excellent, thank you. And just one other question before we move on. Um, Anya asks, how in industrial science and technological innovation will fit into objective four? Well, uh, the industrial uh, innovation and technology fits in many more places than objective four. When you look at objective number two and three, they both heavily rely on new technology, on innovation, and there's an enormous role for the private sector, for industry to really play a role there. But certainly also industry has the opportunity to take the knowledge and the insights that the more scientific or technical community has produced and turn it into information products, into activities that informs other parts of society. So there's an enormous uh, opportunity there for the private sector to engage with the decade. Terrific, okay. Well, thanks everyone for sending in your questions. They're coming in fast and furious now. Um, the, the question box isn't a very good place to ask for assistance with more than 300 people now. We can't um, provide assistance on a one-to-one -one basis, but a number of people have asked about the slides. Those will be made available to you via a link that you'll receive in an email after the webinar. Now, we've heard at all steps of this consultation process just how important data, information and knowledge and, and the sharing and management of data and information and knowledge are to the success of the decade. And evidence needs to underpin all the actions of the decade. It's the foundation for the fit for purpose products, services and applications that need to be delivered to end users and they're part of the whole decade vision. So what I'd like to do is just take a few minutes to walk you through some of the key principles on, that lie behind the decade's approach to knowledge and management. Now, the vision for data, information, knowledge management for the decade is for us to bring together the entire ocean community to co-design and co-develop a digital representation of the ocean that integrates social, economic, and environmental dimensions and variables. And in some senses, you can think of this as a digital twin of the ocean. The decade management framework provides a roadmap to link knowledge generators to end users. The decade itself will support all stakeholders 
in accessing and using information products and services that are tailored to their needs. End users and knowledge generators will need to work together to define the most relevant forms of knowledge delivery. And that's really an important part of this decade. It's providing the decision makers with the data and science they need. To achieve this, we of course need an openly accessible, usable, and responsive digital management framework. And this is a key goal of the decade. This goal, of course, will require collective efforts to overcome a number of barriers, including, but not limited to, things like data fragmentation, the siloing of data, lack of data sharing, and hidden or underexploited data sets, just to name a few. Next slide, please. The coordinated effort required to achieve the decade's aspiration, aspirations for knowledge sharing will require the shared best practices across scales, sectors, and capacities. And we'll need to innovate and respond to the evolving needs of the decade while still maintaining the operational integrity of data. To build this data management framework, we must build on existing systems and focus on ensuring that these systems are interoperable that they can communicate together and we can harness the massive information and knowledge that we're gaining. The decade will embrace and promote timely, free and open access and use, reuse and redistribution of the observational data, all for the greatest public good. This is reflected as you've seen in the endorsement criteria for decade actions. And there's significant data management capability exists in some countries, but not everywhere. And so a major focus of the decade will be on coordinating and strengthening capacity in those places where it's weak. So let's see if, let me just look here and see if we have any data specific questions here. Well, we have a lot. So, so Jorn asks about um, science and society rather than science to policy. And I think that's a really important question because we have for past decades talked a lot about how to make science easier for policymakers to use and for society to use. But with the decade, we're really trying to do a much better job of listening to decision makers overall and providing them with the data and science they need to answer their questions. So it really is in a sense, turning the science to policy on its head a bit. And most of the other questions we have so far about the science plan, let's see. Okay, and, and another question is, more data does not necessarily lead to better decisions. How do we improve um, better decision-making? And, and part of that is through the co-design of data, um, data production, knowledge systems. And, and the decade has a very strong focus on the production of tools, applications, and other ways of using information to try to answer the many questions that different stakeholders have. Okay, let's move on from data now. Um, Data, of course, is a critical pillar, but there is also another foundational pillar for the decade, which is capacity development. I'd like to ask Craig McLean to talk a little bit about the main highlights and principles of our capacity development framework for the ocean decade. Thank you very much, Linwood, and good day to everyone joining. Capacity development is very much a foundational principle and is also incorporated in the strategic plan of the IOC's daily business. It's also a major element of the United Nations principles that we have. So it's not a surprise to see that at least two of our major objectives for the decade that we've been able to generate here really rely on capacity development. Objective one clearly involves our ability to expand transformative knowledge capacity and capability globally, and objective two in looking at providing ocean knowledge much more uh, further than its origin so that it could be understood globally. If we look at capacity development in our current ocean science capability, it's been quite proven that it is uneven around the globe and documented in such documents as the Global Ocean Science Report. 
I commend that to your reading in order to find the areas where we have the greatest need, although they probably would not surprise you. Capacity development is an essential tenant of the decade, and it aims to reverse the current inequalities of knowledge, skills, and access to technologies in parts of the world where the economies of those nations may not be as strong as others. Capacity development efforts will focus on skills, knowledge, technology, and the like in order to improve the methods of science, but also to understand the relevance of that science to society. Capacity development will therefore target a wide range of actors from scientists to decision makers, students, and members of society at large. Please do note that the criteria of inclusion for decade participation does consider the extent to which a program, an activity, a contribution, or a project might include components of capacity development, and we strongly encourage, since our science is global, to be working globally in order to raise the capabilities and capacity of countries and communities that are not so enabled yet. Next slide, please. The principles of capacity development are described in the implementation plan, but we do not intend <clears throat> excuse me, to set out an exhaustive list of the capacity development components. Many of these components will be described by the situation of an individual project, program, activity, etc. And it's the role of the decade stakeholders and decade participants to identify the most appropriate responses and directions forward. The implementation plan does set a series of principles to guide the development of these responses and we encourage you to refer to those when you're undertaking a submission for consideration to the decade. But key principles will include the fact that many development components need to be needs driven. These should not be one time ad hoc short term visits, but long term partnerships. Many experts in the field of capacity development, whether it be for oceans or other technological advancements, have documented the need for long-term commitments, and there are fine examples in our community of those. Next slide, please. The strategic framework that is identified in the implementation plan, it's, it's presented here in order to provide you with a notion of what we hope to achieve and where we have identified through the planning workshops where the greatest needs arise. These range from education opportunities, professional development opportunities, and includes also a very important term, ocean literacy. In many translations of this term, it can be confusing, but clearly what it speaks to is the ability for citizens, policymakers, and scientists of other disciplines to have a comfortable understanding of the importance of ocean science and how it affects society and the, society, the society's ability to understand the scientific conclusions. Ocean literacy is called out, <clears throat> excuse me, ocean literacy is called out specifically, <clears throat> very sorry, ocean literacy is called out specifically in order to engage in at least four priority areas, advancing policy understanding, providing enhanced formal education to enable collective or corporate action in a global sense and local and global community engagement. I think this concludes the component of capacity development. And if there is time for a question, I'd be happy to take one or two. Okay, there are a number of good questions coming up here. Uh, one question is, how really will the decade connect all of this modern science, this huge flow of data um, with countries that are limited by internet connectivity? I think the answer to that would be by deliberate means. I think we need to, as a global community, identify the components of our community that have needs that we can't immediately address and provide the mechanisms for those. If we're conducting science and we being, for example, the developed nations that have oceanographic capability, if we are conducting science in a region of the globe that is going to be impacted by the findings of that science, we need to find ways to be able to deliver that science locally. And whether it's through temporary satellite means or whether it's through other communication vectors. But I think we, the practitioners of the craft now, have the obligation to be able to share 
and share the understanding of that information. It will vary project by project, but I think there will be means that are apparent for us to do so. Okay, and when the, the decade talks about capacity development, and particularly in developing countries, are, are we talking about capacity development within particular kinds of institutions like governments or universities or, or what? That's another question that we've just received. Capacity development targets really, the understanding targets everyone. The capacity that we might be seeing more commonly referred to in oceanographic programs is largely to increase the science capability of a particular community. And part of that science capability is understanding how to communicate the findings and the importance of those findings to the local community that those those folks might live within. So capacity development starts at a point of providing additional opportunity and understanding, additional tools, additional infrastructure. It could be a sense of organization at a regional or sub-regional level, but the, the intent and the purpose there through this capacity is to be able to then communicate and enable the people who we are engaging with or who a project might engage with to convey the scientific understanding in plain local language so, so the folk who live in that part of the community can understand the importance of the work that's being done and make good decisions individually, locally, and nationally. Okay, terrific. We, we have two very similar questions um, that, that I'll put to you, Craig. They're, I think they're broad questions, but they're certainly in the realm of capacity development. One um, from Ayman is, is, how does the decade really uh, address issues of the sustainable development goals? And then Peter has a similar question about how will this capacity development address economic issues? What's the plan for making this capacity development really meaningful towards those ends? I think a very good perspective to view those questions within is the observation that the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is relying upon the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, but also recognize how those individual goals in the 2030 plan were written several years ago, and through the course of the decade, which will continually develop through these 10 years, we will see additional objectives to attain that would enhance the ability to deliver a sustainable future ocean-based for many components and communities. So that's one point I would offer. The second point I would offer is that the IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, has undertaken a science-oriented pursuit of the UN Decade of Ocean Science. But there are many other United Nations organizations, in fact, all the United Nations organizations, each of which has a portfolio and a domain of practice that will be responsible under the UN for implementing the UN Decade of Ocean Science. So where there may be, for example, a fisheries question or issue, it would not necessarily be within the IOC direction, but within the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, or many of the other UN family of agencies that would have more direct and targeted response to some of these issues. But all these issues we believe would be science-based conducting the science to gain a better understanding or translating existing science through the data discussion we had earlier in order to communicate a, an understanding of the affair and then be able to bring that to wherever the decision makers are, whether they be the head of a family or whether they be the head of a nation. We'll be able to then enlighten people to pursue a sustainable circular economy, all the principles of, of the blue and the green economy that we're familiar with. Thank you. Okay, that's terrific, Craig. And you know, a lot of these questions really remind me to remind you, the audience, that these are the problems that you're going to have to solve. The implementation plan certainly doesn't have all of the answers to these really challenging questions. Um, and it is a framework to get the ball rolling, but we're going to have to figure out a lot of this together as we go along. And, and Molly brought up a point that, um, uh, we didn't discuss very much in my comments about data, but appears throughout the implementation plan, which is the, the need to do a better job of incorporating indigenous and local knowledge in science, in the way we measure the ocean. And she asked um, a very good question about what kinds of capacity 
needs to be developed to make sure that that kind of indigenous and local knowledge is included in this decade. And I think that's a, a, a place where we're really going to need your help. It's a great opportunity, I think, to propose decade projects, programs, and actions. And we really look forward to hearing about your ideas um, along those lines. Okay. So, you know, the, the need to work together and involve a range of stakeholders to achieve the real change that the decade envisions has been raised several times already in this presentation and it's throughout the, um, the implementation plan. For the next part of the presentation, I just want to talk a little bit about how this engagement is going to work uh, in the next decade, or at least in the first few years of the decade. Now, it's important to realize that working collectively is something that we must do and its importance cannot be understated. If you attended the first global planning meeting in Copenhagen, you may have heard me say that for me, the decade is really a movement and it is your decade and it's going to require all of your participation to solve these problems, but it's gonna require a lot more people than the 311 who were on this call today. And it's very important to recognize that the decade will be implemented for and by an incredibly diverse range of stakeholders, probably more diverse than we've worked with in, in this ocean community to date, because we wanna make the tent so much bigger than it has been. So trying to get the active and continued, continued engagement of this incredibly diverse stakeholder group is going to be important. Engagement is required throughout the value chain in order for co-design and co-delivery of ocean science. Engagement is needed for efficient knowledge sharing, to develop fit-for-purpose products, services, and application. And it's engagement that really is needed to foster and stimulate innovation across all actors, disciplines, and at all levels. And that's why I think it's so important that this is a UN project because it was going to require global engagement and a new way of working. There are a number of key stakeholder groups that have been identified throughout the preparation process. The boundaries between different stakeholder groups are fluid and this fluidity emphasizes the need for a flexible and broad approach to engagement with multiple entry points for engagement for multiple interests. And I know many of us find ourselves in more than one stakeholder group, and please don't let yourself be siloed um, in just one stakeholder group. We need as much cross-fertilization as we can get. Convening and supporting diverse groups of stakeholders to co-design and co-deliver transformative ocean science is an extremely high priority for all of us who've been working on the decade. To achieve this, the decade will need to generate the right conditions for collaboration Mechanisms such as the Global Stakeholder Forum and an international conference series will focus on bringing together end users and knowledge generators. There will be periodic calls for action for programs and projects as we've heard, and a first version of this will be um, initiated later this year. Institutions and groups of stakeholders that are committed to aligning their efforts with the vision and mission of the decade will be able to register as decade implementing partners or decade stakeholder platforms. They'll be able to engage in global stakeholder forum as a means of establishing new partnerships and collaborating around decade actions. And a number of mechanisms will stimulate engagement at national levels in support of co-design and co-delivery of actions. The Ocean Decade Alliance will be launched to catalyze large scale commitments and to stimulate networking, resource mobilization, and to influence other people to join the Alliance. Alliance members, both institutional and individual, will lead by example and will motivate action by others. Now, at the outset of the decade, we need to encourage all stakeholders and not just the usual suspects to become advocates of the decade, to communicate about the decade, and to inspire action. And we need this to be a real movement. And we need funders to step up early and support the decade to get this ball rolling. To launch this movement, a communication strategy is being developed now currently with a clear focus on outreach and branding and is based around the theme of Generation Ocean or Gen O, which will seek to spur all generations to take action 
and everyone who has a stake in the ocean, which really is all of humanity, to come together to work to use the best available science and knowledge to deliver the ocean we need for the future we want. So that is um, the beginning of the communications plan, the engagement plan, but it really is to get the ball rolling. And as this decade develops and the tent gets bigger and more and more ideas come to the table and more people come to the table, this communication plan will evolve because we have to maintain this engagement. Now we have just a few minutes for um, a couple of questions. So let me just check over here with the questions. Let's see what we have here. So uh, Sheila Hammonds asks if, if we still need a conference series given the COVID crisis and do we want to go back to business as usual for travel? And, and I don't know that by saying we're going to have a conference series means that we're going to have big global conferences. Um, we certainly will have to operate in the world as it is when the decade starts and we need to be as creative as possible. So this is a, a good example of how this presentation today of how the IOC staff has already trying to uh, adjust on the fly. But I think what we need to hear from you is new and better ways of, of bringing stakeholders together, um, getting away from death by presentation and, and really getting into meaningful collaboration. So Elisa here just says that, that she agrees that scientists need to become more activists and believe in the decade because there's an urgent need uh, to change the world. And so what we have to do, I think, is really recognize that need, but we have to find solutions. And that really is going to be clearly important for us as we go forward, because it can't just be science for science sake at this point when the ocean is changing so fast and the human population is changing equally quickly. The time frame, what is the time frame to submit comments to the, the draft? It's April 17th. And let's see, I'll take one more question here. Well, it's a question about how do you sustain human resources at local levels and national levels? Um, and this is definitely a part of capacity building. We call it um, in some of our earlier work, capacity and capability building. And it is very important that these capacity building projects don't just provide local training, but create new ways of keeping capacity in country. How we do that, once again, is going to be all up to all of us to try to figure out. It's going to vary by place, it's going to vary by scale, and it's going to vary by the kind of capacity that's being developed. How can we coordinate between programs and projects? Um, there will be knowledge sharing platforms beyond just data sharing platforms that will be initiated and catalyzed by the decade, trying to find new ways of communicating with each other, recognizing that we all have different ways of communicating is going to be tremendously important. Okay, so let's see here, where are we in our schedule? Okay, now we, we've talked about a lot of the, the key elements of the implementation plan and the decade but uh, of course, uh, a movement of this type, this size, uh, a plan of such ambition is going to require organization. It needs to be orchestrated. It needs to be monitored so that we know that we're achieving the decade's objectives. And towards this end, I'd like to invite Craig back to just take us through a little bit about the approach to governance, coordination, and monitoring for the decade. Thank you, Linwood. If we look at what is in front of you in this slide, you realize that the United Nations General Assembly has voted to approve the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and has asked the IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, 
to provide the leadership of the decade. The next body down is a decade board, which would be constructed under the IOC organizational leadership, but would include other UN bodies, including UN Oceans. And for those of you who are familiar with the United Nations governance structure, UN Oceans has a responsibility for coordinating all ocean aspects underneath the UN. The IOC has the responsibility to, to be leading science in an intergovernmental way. Attached to this, you see the Decade Coordination Unit, which is staffed by the employees or the secretariat of the IOC. The IOC is made up of about 150 member states or nations, and the IOC Secretariat, a small community of people who have worked to put this teleconference on for you, have supported us as members of the Executive Planning Group, but worked very diligently to make sure that the decade will be coordinated, staffed, and run appropriately. The decade board will be a decision-making body that will be guiding, controlling, and further coordinating the decade. The subject of coordination I might mention now as we transition to the next slide is that we will govern the decade to keep its propriety and its dignity in an appropriate way. But in terms of the coordination, please do remember and rely on the existing elements of coordination of the scientific fields. For example, there was a wide global community that met in Hawaii for Ocean OBS 19 and 10 years before that, and 10 years before that in other locations to discuss the global needs for ocean observing. We can be extending the participation in such organizational groups as that by bringing in members of nations who don't routinely have a presence in ocean observing, but who easily could if we were to invite them in and provide them with, as we discussed earlier, the capacity development resolve that should come along with the decade. So coordinate through your existing bodies as a science community. That would be my encouragement. As we continue with the coordination framework in an organized sense, the decade coordinating unit or coordination unit, excuse me, which will be part of the IOC staff and secretariat has then extended structures that we would label as being decentralized. The regional coordination office and the regional collaborative centers these would be constructed by, in the case of the offices, a more formal arrangement with the IOC. We already have several of those for data and for the global ocean observing system. We have them located in such countries as the, um, the government of Flanders and Belgium, Australia and others. But these are some formal arrangements with the IOC in the regional coordinating centers. In the regional collaborative centers, these can be hosted by any nation, by any aggregate of nations, or by international organizations that want to gather together in order to coordinate a particular activity. Many of these already exist with, for example, under the theme of ocean observing, POGO or GOOS, the Global Ocean Observing System. Then we have existing program and regional coordination structure, which is an overlap where the existing programs could take up the character of a regional collaborative center by a subset of an ocean observing system or by, for example, GOOS itself. Another existing program that might have an embedded regional coordination structure would be seen in what many are familiar with now as the Seabed 2030 proposal. It's an existing program. It has member activity. It's actually co-sponsored by the IOC and the IHO, the International Hydrographic Organization. But there is an example of an existing program that does have an embedded regional coordination structure. So once again, I, I encourage you to be looking at existing structures that we could rely on for the coordinating mechanism. You may have the next slide, please. In terms of mobilizing resources to pay for the activity that's going to be undertaken through the decade, we have to recognize that principally, the governments of the world will be paying for most of the science activity as the governments of the world have traditionally been paying for most of the ocean science in the world. But we are stirred to the optimism to see the, the recent emergence of philanthropic organizations industry-based contributions to ocean science and ocean data, and other aspects and components of society. So it is going to take many hands to generate the costs necessary to accomplish the decade. To that end, the United Nations, nor the IOC, 
has a succinct dedicated budget to pay for the decade. These expenses are going to have to come from member states. So it would be important for the people who are on this call in the roles that you play in informing your governments or your sponsors of the particular work you would like to undertake and work to secure the resources necessary in order to do so. So we have several different ways that the decade can be supported. It can come through direct support to a decade activity. It can come through investing in support of the Decade Alliance, which you heard a bit about earlier from Linwood. And the Alliance is an adjunct to the IOC activity that would basically receive the resources or the commitments of in-kind capacity in order to enhance the success of the decade. Support through the Decade Alliance could be generated through purposeful, directed, earmarked funding, or could also be directed through in-kind or other kinds of coordination and activity. And then lastly, the partner-led financing and grant-making facility can be enabled by any organization that wants to establish itself as supporting the decade. We are very grateful to have heard from a number of philanthropic organizations that have the intent to do a number of these things here, as we do know that multiple governments will do the same. Next slide, please. In terms of measuring progress, this will not be an overly um, administratively burdened enterprise, but we do plan, as you can see in this slide, to have a number of reports that will take back from the field, from the, the parties that are providing the work in programs, projects, and activities, or contributions, and being able to report back to the UN exactly what we're getting done and how we are effectively implementing science to provide the future that we want and to be able to report to the UN decade of the propriety of this exercise. I don't believe I need to go much further in terms of the progress measurements. These will be developed with further detail as the decade takes off and we start to see the results. And may I pause now for any questions that we might have? Yeah, correct. So I'll start with the, um, the the hardest question to answer, but a number of people have asked it, which is how much money and resources is this going to take? That's an excellent question, and I'm not really sure anyone knows the answer. And I think in terms of putting a large number out is probably uh, somewhere in the domains of fiction. But if we were to look at taking this objective or, or excuse me, this challenge in smaller bites, for example, what is the true cost that we need to address to have a global ocean system that is fit for purpose in every major ocean basin? We can handle that. We can discuss that and develop that. I think if we take this one piece at a time, we would be doing very well. I think if you were to compare the global expense of what we would hope to achieve in the decade of ocean science and compare that to the decade of the space race, we might possibly be in, in the same domain and, um, and have some order of magnitude. But to me, that's really only a speculative offering. I think if we look discipline by discipline, basin by basin, we can come up with a reasonable estimate of what it would take. But we need to be advocating for the, the appropriate attention of our, our collective governments in order to address these. Okay. Um, if someone wants to take a lead or a leading role in their nation's National Coordinating Committee, how do they do that? Who do they contact? I believe that would be, at first step, a domestic question that the person or parties who would be interested in leading their nation's coordinating committee, they should self-organize or seek the approval of whatever authority may exist domestically. Once done, then simply contact the, the UN decade coordinating unit that would be staffing the decade for coordinating purposes. We will be providing, and I'm sure the IOC staff will be further providing some specific decoration, uh, excuse me, some uh, specific direction for how these will be implemented and, and what due dates and um, what type of governance description would be necessary. But the point of contact would be with the IOC staff, the decade coordinating unit once founded. Okay. And 
would it be possible and would there be um, a mechanism of trying to include indigenous knowledge holders in decade government governance that sort of really gets to the question is who is it that's involved in um, governing the decade going forward and then what role does the EPG have in future governance of the decade? For indigenous knowledge, I think that's a very appropriate observation that has been called out in a number of the planning meetings and workshops. So I think that activity is very much on the mind of the UN decade supervision, which is the IOC itself and then also the IOC secretariat. But the process of selecting the members of the decade board, which will be implementing and overseeing the decade, that is the, the group that would be nominating. And that's where we could possibly have a, a person or persons with indigenous knowledge experience incorporated in there. And uh, you, you had a second half of that question. Could you repeat it? Well, so the second half of the question is sort of, how will the EPG be involved in governance going forward? And Thank you. Yeah, and yes. Who, you know, if not the EPG. Well, the EPG, the executive planning group, of which there are 20 of us now, we will migrate and disappear upon the implementation of the decade. And the roles and responsibilities that the EPG has now, which is to guide the decade, would transition over to this decade board, which then would incorporate people of varied expertise and relevant knowledge of the matters of which we're trying to achieve here, sustainable development, that is ocean science supported and based. It would also include UN agencies, and those experts will be chosen by the IOC. Okay. Terrific. And then the, the final question is, is the, is the decade itself going to be distributing resources? The decade itself is a, a titular notion. It is a titled notion that we have, that we all need to be contributing to and finding the resources in order to make the decade a reality. The component of the decade that may have resources to distribute would be the Decade Alliance, which would be overseen by the IOC, but it's a it's an appurtenance, it's an attachment to the IOC, but it is not itself directly the IOC. There may be funds that are given to the IOC for the decade, and they could be dispensed, but I would encourage anyone of a scientific ambition to recognize that your greatest probability of funding would likely be through the more traditional routes of funding through governments, through philanthropic organizations, industry-based sponsors, or other parties that might be able to contribute money to the success of this activity. The decade itself is not organizing to have a particular budget for distribution for science. We have to find those opportunities and fundings ourselves in order to go out and conduct this work. We may be supplemented or augmented, but the funds available would not likely be coming from the decade itself. The alliance is, I think, being created for that purpose. But once again, the alliance cannot afford, uh, doubtful that the alliance would be in a position to be receiving sufficient resources to be the backbone of funding. But certainly a, um, a, a very enabling component of the activities of the decade. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and I also just point out that part of the idea behind the decade is to create a new way of working so that industry, local government, everyone sees the value of investing in ocean science um, that's dedicated to solving these sustainable development challenges. So when we talk about the decade and we talk about this huge vision, the, the decade is the catalyst um, and the secretariat that runs this is the catalyst, but it's going to create, really require a, a transformation in, in how we um, run this global ocean science and sustainable development enterprise. Now, I want to um, address a, a question that's come up a number of times here, uh, which is, why isn't there more gender balance in today's panel? And um, I will tell you that the Thursday version of this same panel is three quarters women. So the gender balance today, which is more men, has almost everything to do 
with um, the short time span of putting this together and time zones. But the decade has both gender balance and generational balance as key milestones for everything they do and every action that's taken. Well, uh, thanks, Craig, for, for making that second presentation. And, and thanks, everyone, for all of these questions that you're sending in. I'm starting to feel a little overwhelmed. Um, now that we've, we've covered the, the core parts of the implementation plan, and, and believe me, these are just the highlights. You really need to read the plan if you haven't already done so to get a full flavor for what is planned. Um, I'd like to invite Alison Clausen from the IOC Secretariat to tell us about what's going to happen uh, in terms of rolling out the decade and getting this launched. Okay, thanks very much, Lynn Wood, and good afternoon, good evening to, to everybody that is on the call. We're currently at about 314 attendees, so it's a, it's really great to see everybody putting aside the time to, to talk about this. Before I start, I, you know, we, we obviously need to recognise we're in a, in a fairly unique period at the moment. Um, the IOC, as we're thinking about next steps, we're really trying to be as sensitive to the situation and reactive as possible. Um, things are changing rapidly, as you as you all know. Um, so what I'm going to present here is our best guess at the moment of some of the, the key dates. I think the processes and the general uh, milestones are going to stay the same, but it's it's obvious, I think, that there will be changes in, in some of the dates of, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, for some of these for some of these key steps you can see in this slide there are still a number of processes ongoing we are nearing the end of the preparation phase which started in in 2018 and which will end at the end of end of this year but we've got some some big milestones coming up we've got some 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 activities that are that are that are still underway I think that some of the, the the key things that I wanted to bring to your attention were the close of the comments period um, on the implementation plan, which, as Linwood mentioned, is the 17th of April. There are two parallel processes going on. There is a, a, a peer review process, which are, I think we've got about 300, 350 organisations that have been asked to contribute to that peer review process. Um, and then there is feedback following the webinar series, and Linwood will explain to you how you can provide that feedback um, in a written form so that that can be taken into account in the next version of the implementation plan. Once we have all that feedback, we're going to have a, a massive task of distilling it, picking out the, the, the key messages, um, discussing very closely with the executive planning group about what changes need to be made so that we can put together a final draft implementation plan uh, that will be accom accompanied by a summary report, which will be, I guess, a, an easier to read version of the implementation plan. We realise that it's a long document, it's a fairly technical document in some places, and given that we really want to focus on inclusiveness and, and reaching a broad range of stakeholders, it's not the best document to do that. So there will be a summary report. There will also be a regional synthesis report, which will um, pick up the key outcomes and actions from the regional planning meetings. As Vladimir mentioned in the beginning, we had 11 of those meetings. There are a couple more that are still planned that will be held virtually, and over a thousand people participated in those. So the discussions were extremely rich, and we will be capturing those in a regional synthesis report that will set out some more geographically uh, targeted priorities um, and actions. Um, so all that you can expect to see coming out around June it will be submitted for the approval or endorsement of the IOC governing bodies before being presented to the UN General Assembly. Now, again, those dates, June and September, that's that's our best guess at this point. But as you can imagine, things are, as I said, changing, changing very quickly. But the aim is to have those those sort of formal approvals done throughout the towards the end of this year. The decade then begins, obviously, 1st of January 2021, and we're currently uh, very busily planning different kickoff events for that. Um, the, the German government has very generously uh, offered to, to host a kickoff conference, which is planned for May, June 2021 in Berlin. And we're also talking to different partners about regional kickoff events, such as a, a conference in Cairo in Egypt in, in February next year. And we hope that there will be other events around the world as well to really celebrate together the, the start of the decade. 
Some of the other things that we're that we're looking at, um, and and we're we're still to be to be very honest, we're, we're still looking at how best to 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 stagger these over the next eight months or so, because many of them were planned to be launched at the UN Ocean Conference in June in Lisbon, as I think most people are, uh, are very aware now. That has been postponed, which has meant we're over the last couple of weeks just we're we're really rethinking about the strategy for for staggering some of these other um, initiatives over the year. But the idea is to have a launch of the Ocean Decade Alliance that both Linwood and Craig spoke about, which is one of the, the major resource mobilization mechanisms for the decade. So having an initial group of members of that alliance and having a visible launch of that alliance so that it incites others to join and, 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 and get a groundswell of activity around resource mobilization. We will be starting to launch a decade, um, a staggered series of decade calls for actions. Now, these are the, the main mechanisms by which proponents or interested parties can submit ideas for programs, for projects, for activities, for contributions, for endorsement as, as decade actions using those endorsement criteria that, that Martin talked about. Um, I think it's important to point out that it's not IOC who is, who is going to be proposing programs, um, although we may have some that are coming from some of the from some of the IOC teams and units, but really the idea of a of a decade program can come from any any proponent around the world. So these are these are really going to be um, fairly open calls for actions. They'll they'll probably be staggered. Some will be targeted on certain geographic areas, some may be targeted more at the program level, others at the at the at the at the project level. We'll also be looking once the, the different approvals have been underway about starting the establishment of the governance structures, including the board and so on. And we just had a, a, a brief discussion with Linwood and Craig about, um, or you heard just briefly from Linwood and Craig about some of the, the, the diversity criteria that will be taken into account establishing those governance structures. And certainly the plan itself includes a lot more detail on how we how we see that, that diversity element being worked into the to the governance structures um, for the for the decade. If we can move to the next slide. So one one key thing in in sort of in the very short term, I think, is is we want to extend this um, series or extend a, a, a more detailed se series of virtual sessions and webinars. Today we've only got two hours to give you a very quick overview of the implementation plan, and we're very conscious that it has has only allowed us to you know touch on key points. You obviously have the document, but again, it's it's a long document, um, and and not everybody has the time to go through it in depth. So we're looking over the next few months to be rolling out a, a series of more detailed webinars and virtual sessions. We have some initial ideas about um, what some of these could focus on, for example, discussions focusing more around science or delving further into capacity development, um, looking at some of the themes that have really come out, particularly through the regional consultations, so ocean literacy, um, the role of the private sector, uh, small island developing states, traditional local knowledge, gender, and so on. We would really like to hear your feedback on the types of issues that you would perhaps like to investigate or explore in in more detail, and if we can if we can get enough interest, we can we can develop some some virtual sessions and webinars around these. Some of them may be held later in the year once we're we're moving into um, the process of calls for action, so that they can actually be used as as vehicles or platforms for bringing different partners together, and ideally developing uh, new partnerships and and new ideas for for collaboration. So certainly in your feedback, uh, which Linwood will explain to you how that's how that's going to happen, um, please do think about other ideas or issues that you'd like to explore in further detail. Just in finishing. Um, Please do register on the Decade website if you haven't done so already. That is the best place to, to be getting information about um, what's happening, and particularly in this period where things are, are changing very rapidly. There's an, there's an option there to register into the database so that you're getting mail outs um, and communications regularly from the from the team as there is as there's more information to to share. So perhaps I'll leave it there for the moment, but very happy to take any questions about upcoming uh, upcoming events or, or next steps in the process. Okay, thanks, Alison. And and Elva, 
um, Escobar reminds us that the, the Western Atlantic Regional Workshop will be held on April 28th and 29th, um, not 27th and 28th. And it will be a virtual regional workshop. So uh, Jorn pointed out that there are lots of meetings that are required to get this decade rolling and that could have a high carbon footprint. But um, there's no reason that these regional meetings require people to travel very long distances. And, and as the decade rolls out, we're going to see many, many, many meetings at many scales, and particularly small scales, which leads to a question that Anna Zivian had, um, which is, is there a role for local government and state governments, or regional governments at a sub-national level um, in the decade? And I'll open this up to all of our panelists, including Vladimir, to answer that. Vladimir, would you like to answer that? Yes, thank you very much, Linwood, for this question, and also to Anna for, for posing it. I think that uh, the decade is about mainstreaming uh, ocean um, uh, science and observations and turning them into solutions. And we know that oceanography is a regional science, and solutions are very much uh, oriented sometimes to, uh, to local conditions. So we hope very much by giving uh, to uh, to develop the indicate in such a way that by offering a global platform and some global solutions and approaches, we will be able to uh, translate these solutions into into a series of uh, of of local actions. So uh, there are a lot of local actions in the world, for example, collecting plastic. So they're all very useful. But in principle, of course, we would like to offer the scientific approach that will be enabling a management of the ocean. Um, for example, maritime special planning is uh, uh, something that is implemented on the regional scale for exclusive economic zones. So uh, there are uh, establishment of marine protected areas uh, requires involvement of, of local authorities. So uh, indeed, uh, we believe if, the, if we are successful, then we will be have a, a, a full scope and full spectrum of activities ending up in much more successful management of the ocean space and resources at local level. You know, but the problem is that IUC is, for example, a global organization. And for us to go from, from the global level to the level where the action is sometimes difficult, that's why I think the logo of the decade looks not only like a wave, but also like a snowball. This needs to grow like a snowball and result in massive action at the local scale. Okay, and while I have you, Vladimir, uh, there's another question from Ibukan um, about the, the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which also begins in 2021. And, and to what degree is the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development coordinating with the UN Decade of Restoration? So thank you very much, Linda, and also for the Ibukan for the question. Um, I have a feeling that, you know, there are a lot of uh, familiar people here. We hope very much we're also reaching to some who are coming here for the first time. But anyway, uh, in, uh, indeed, uh, there is a, a decade of uh, ecosystem restoration that is coordinated by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the United Nations Environment. Uh, it has a, a also a subset, a, a, a subdivision focusing on, on, on ocean ecosystems. So we are in touch with these two organizations. Uh, we are developing uh, common approaches to, to, to certain issues. And my understanding is, uh, which is actually shared by some functionaries in the United Nations environment, is that we need to develop the science to understand what needs to be done uh, to, to uh, restore ecosystems. To some extent, despite this uh, two decades overlap completely in time, the ocean science should be, I think, the first focus, and then with armed by science, we will be able to uh, more successfully restore ecosystems. So the answer is yes, we are speaking to them, and we hope very much that uh, this, this cooperation will be mutually uh, beneficial. Terrific. Uh, let's go to Guillermo. Guillermo, we've had a number of people ask how they become involved in the ECOP. And then 
I want to ask you after you tell us that, how are you going to, to keep young scientists, especially interdisciplinary scientists, engaged? Guillermo is still muted. Okay, try now, Guillermo. All right, I think, does that work? Yes, it works. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you for the question. Um, so over the last um, uh, 100 days since we first launched the survey, the most straightforward answer would be uh, connect with us via the uh, IOC ECOP survey to provide your input about what you consider are the best um, sort of the best way to invest resources to build capacity and answer uh, scientific knowledge gaps. Um, since the survey has closed today, now we're entering a, a new phase where we're building the internal architecture of the ECOP group, uh, generating um, or establishing smaller task groups to address the five areas of, of work that I, that I spoke about earlier. Um, and we will be uh, opening up uh, positions within each of those uh, areas of work to, to advance our projects, to build a, uh, a network of networks that we're calling to build an online portal and to further the work um, to, to conduct more, more surveys essentially to keep using uh, this, this form of um, communication to get uh, a sense of what ECOPS think uh, should be done and keep communicating that to, to the IOC. Terrific. And, and how are you going to get young professionals who are not involved in ocean science, but should be involved here? Computer scientists, yeah. psychologists, economists. Have you thought about that? So that's a great question, and I think that's uh, uh, perhaps the, the 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 concern that led uh, a, a core number of ECOPs uh, back in Copenhagen last year to to uh, develop this survey. We realized that it was only a small subset of us that were partaking in these conversations, um, and that we were not achieving enough uh, demographic and professional representativity. Um, and so I honestly think that a lot of it is going to have to be a bottom-up effort using our, our contacts, as, um, our personal contacts and networks to reach out to those other communities that, that could play a role in this decade, but that are currently not part of the conversation. And there are many ECOPs around the world that, that aren't uh, on this call, that don't know this is happening um, in many developing states. Um, and getting, getting in, in contact with them will be uh, something that we all have to do together. There's been many people at IOC that have uh, done a fantastic job. Everyone on this call right now probably knows someone, an early career ocean professional in a developing country or a small state around the world that uh, can become a leader um, in their in their region. Um, so it is every, I encourage everyone essentially to to reach out to those young professionals and um, put them in touch with us so we can have a network that is diverse geographically, demographically, and, and from a professional standpoint. Terrific. And Linwood, this is Craig. May I offer a comment? Please do. I want to go back to the question that Guillermo answered excellently, but also to add to that, the way to have the ECOPs strong and, and sustained is for us who may hold ourselves out as having an established position in the ocean science community to be reaching into the youth and early career professionals of our knowledge and to be able to bring those people to the forefront of thinking, planning, and execution. Thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. And, and, and Martin, I'll ask you, thinking from the perspective of the science objectives, how do you imagine that we're re-envisioning that big tent that needs to be involved to achieve the four science objectives? Well, thank you, Linwood. I think, uh, again, the, my fellow panelists have given good answers. But in, in my view, is uh, the decade has a, a wonderful opportunity to actually go much beyond our typical breadth and reach of our communities. I mean, I myself am a physical oceanographer. I certainly know my community very well. Over the last 10 years, I uh, met a lot of other ocean scientists and ocean experts, ocean professionals that go much beyond my discipline. These are ecologists, ocean economists, ocean policy people, people like yourself, Linwood, from NGOs and so on. So I think that helps to grow my perspective and my tent. And I think 
the decade has the opportunity to do that not only with some of us but actually uh, around the globe and i think the way we do that is uh, by designing our programs our contributions our activities our projects in a way that i think each and every one of us thinks about maybe i'm not going to put just my community forward but i'm going to use the decade to reach out to another part of either the world another discipline another part of society another actor and in that way organically grow the footprint of what we do i think this is clearly uh, what the ambition for the decade calls for it is ocean science for sustainable development so it calls out two types of communities that we think we want to put closer together and and if i may lynn would make a small comment when we use the word ocean science i don't think we mean ocean natural science we mean ocean science in the grander word of the word science that means including social science humanities but we're also thinking of including engineering about technical expertise so it's the more broadest sense of the word ocean science that you can imagine but all these expertise together uh, co-design activities, solution perspectives to inform our local, regional, national and global uh, ocean development policies and actions. But I think the way we're going to grow that tent is really by personal engagement, by good efforts that each and every one of us does in his or her quarters to really reach out to other knowledge holders that might have something to offer to a challenge that we have identified. And I think in that way, we can organically grow the community. And maybe looking back to us 10 years ago, we would say, I'm so surprised that we were so siloed and so insular in our thinking. I just cannot imagine doing that uh, going forward in 2030. So that's the kind of transformation I would like to see that our disciplinary borders become something of the past, but there is, I'm not against disciplines, but I think we are much more collaborative in what we do. And we really put together these teams and actions that really are needed to answer the questions and the challenges that sustainable development in the ocean context holds for us. Thank you, Michael. And, and someone asks, um, whether the EPG reflected all of those disciplines, and we certainly reflected many, and we had people from natural sciences, economics, policy, policymakers, management. But going forward, the everything that is associated with the decade has to meet really ambitious um, goals for diversity and interdisciplinarity. And so I think, that's where you'll see increased diversity. And someone wrote a question and asked um, about racial diversity and north-south diversity and geographic diversity. And these things appear in this implementation plan, but they really have to be put into practice going forward. And that largely requires bottom-up participation in creating new ways for partic to participate from the bottom up. We had a lot of questions about varying can i speak to that then but for one please do yeah please do so i think one particular comment or maybe way forward against this growing the diversity a lot of times in the executive planning meetings and also in the regional consultation we heard these concepts of twinning twinning meaning that one community finds another community they want to work with and again, this could be across disciplines, this could be across regions, it could be global north, global south twinning, but I really think twinning makes it more personal. It is two players, two partners, two communities coming together and really working through the issues uh, and on, on joint activities for a length of time. So I see a lot of potential for this type of twinning activities a very personal example at GeoMar, where I work at Geo, we work since more than a decade in Cape Verde. So we have an ocean science center in Mindelo, and it's really exciting for us to see how from that scientific collaboration we can branch out into the Cape Verdean ocean knowledge community. And it's things like that where you make a very really commitment to this twinning activity to go beyond your own community. And I think that can be, by the twinning, it's more personal, it's more concrete than a global statement about diversity. Thanks, Martin. 
so what I was going to mention is that um, a, a number of you have asked about technological challenges that face developing countries. Um, some of you have mentioned internet connectivity explicitly, but also lack of capacity. And um, how do we work with communities that have very different cultures and ways of using science and data? From a, a data perspective, we know that we have to figure out what the user wants. And while we want to make sure that these massive amounts of data are available to everyone, not everyone wants all of the massive amounts of data at once. So we're, we're really spending a lot of time at this implementation phase thinking about what it is that we can do to make data available in ways that meet the needs of users that do have different capacities for um, using and analyzing data and how can we build those capacities. Uh, let's see here. One question, maybe this is for you, Craig, is, is who can propose projects to the decade? And what happens if you're proposing a project that um, is in line with what the decade wants to achieve, but can't meet all of the lofty goals um, that the decade requires? Linwood, thank you for the question. I think people should be relieved once they review in the implementation plan what the criteria of acceptance are for inclusion in the decade. They are not in all cases absolute and they're not really a strenuous reach to meet the objectives that we've described during the course of this call. What folks might be encouraged to do is realize that many of those attributes require the best efforts of demonstration in order to appropriately address the requirement. For example, in capacity development, there will likely be projects, the vast majority of projects, that incorporate capacity development opportunities, but we have carefully labeled them as not being an absolute requirement. So if one comes forward with an idea, a standalone idea, I think it's going to require a funding source and it's also going to find the need for some collaborative engagement beyond just one single person or small entity, but an industry or an individual company or a university or a nation can be the genesis, the beginning and the start of something. Imagine a small project in a small island. There is there, I would hope to be a network of communication between that, that island person and scientist with another extension, whether it be a philanthropic group, an NGO, or a government, and be able to blossom that idea into something that could be funded and then submitted to the IOC, where the review would certainly take into consideration the resources of the entity that's proposing and also the resources that might be standing behind that proposal. So um, we, we strongly encourage anyone and everyone to be sending their ideas forward and I think the spirit of the IOC will be found to be willing to work with folks to find successful pathways. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, we have a, a, a really interesting question here, I think, for um, perhaps Allison or, or Vladimir. And the question is that the, the EPG has many very senior members. We've talked about the ECOP as a way for young, uh, early career professionals to get involved. But what about middle career professionals who are doing a lot of the work that um, is taking place in ocean science and in sustainable development? How are we going to engage these middle career professionals? As a gentleman, maybe I would just let Alison go first and then I will try myself. <laughs> Thank you, Vladimir. I'll let you. I'll let you complete. I think you know it's 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 really important, and we've we've tried to be very conscious of this when we've been looking at things like governance, the governance structure, and when we've been looking at things like the endorsement criteria for how programs and projects have have been developed. We talk about generational diversity. We don't talk about senior or early career so much as generational diversity. And what we'd like to see is in that 
all those structures that the that the decades is establishing or supporting and the programs and projects that are being endorsed that that generational diversity from young to middle to to more senior is is represented um and and you know just as an example in in talking about the board we don't have we're not recommending that it, there is an ECOP representative on the board. We're recommending that across the 20 experts on the board, that generational diversity is taken into account so that you will get that full spectrum of um, of different people at different different career stages. So I think it's I think it's a really important point that we've perhaps implicitly taken into account, but I think we could probably draw that out um, so that it does it is more visible in the in the way things are presented in the plan. Thank you. Uh, we, we've had someone already ask about the UN Decade of Restoration, but people are asking more generally, how is it that the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development will interact with other UN processes, um, the Convention on Biodiversity and other international treaties and regional seas efforts? Who wants to tackle that one? I think I'm simply obliged to answer this question. And indeed, uh, what hasn't been mentioned yet is the process that exists in the United Nations, uh, developing an international legally binding agreement on uh, conservation and uh, sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction. So things are changing. And I believe very much that uh, what we are trying to achieve uh, through the decade, particularly in the areas of capacity development, and also in uh, addressing uh, the understanding of ecosystems, would be really directly contributing to decision making and establishing better science policy interface in those areas. Indeed, there is now a process of reconsidering the uh, biodiversity targets, and we are working this this, this process. So uh, that is about biodiversity. Uh, and I think also we, uh, what we are trying to do in developing of the science plan is capitalizing on the recent uh, review of the state of biodiversity uh, in the governmental uh, panel on biodiversity and system services, IPDES. So uh, indeed, the ocean science for sustainable development means that we have to contribute to the mandate of many other organizations. Take, for example, WMO. WMO is interested in exploiting predictability uh, on a different time ranges and it sits in the ocean very much. So think about FAO and we know how the climate is changing and uh, uh, much depends on the capacity of the ocean to absorb carbon. So you know there is a direct implication for, for FAO and it can continue uh, this, this uh, line of thought. And of course, the regional seas organizations with which we work together uh, in the IOC uh, they will be direct beneficiaries and I hope very much also drivers of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the process because this is the governance process that exists. We hope very much that in the result of implementation of, 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 uh, of the decade, we are going to have a knowledge base and database and decision-making uh, system that will be supporting activities of regional sister organizations. So indeed, uh, what we are uh, trying to achieve is the science that contributes to ocean management. And the regional seas organizations indeed are trying to develop the, uh, the efficient ways of managing the ocean. So these processes need to converge. Thank you. Thanks. Can I also add a non-UN perspective to this? Uh, uh, because I think the other opportunity that the decade has, many of you on the call are also involved in other processes like IPBIS, like IPCC, like in the Regional Seas Convention, BBNJ, I'm just throwing out some acronyms. But I think the idea here is that if you feel that your community could see a bit more visibility, those of you who want to sort of make the, or raise the awareness in these organizations for ocean sustainable development. I think the decade offers that opportunity to really highlight the work and to have a constructive dialogue with our sister UN organizations and ask them what part of what they do do they want to highlight in the ocean decade for sustainable development. And I think that's a, I think a wonderful opportunity space because the decade is not a funding mechanism, is one of visibility, of one of uh, 
convening expertise and, and really putting our best foot forward. And I see a plenty of opportunities to really raise the profile of the ocean, to raise the contribution and the opportunities that ocean information, ocean knowledge, ocean science has in these other processes. So I think I see great opportunities for more synergy and joined up visibility. Thanks, Martin. There's, there's clearly uh, an appetite in many of these questions to go beyond the general principles we've set out in the implementation plan to really getting to work and doing concrete things. And, and one of the panelists, or sorry, one of the participating audience members has asked if, if there's a plan for how we're going to get explicit about asking for funds for um, specific kinds of science that needs to be done. How are we going to put out there to the alliance, to um, the decade partners, to national uh, coordinating committees, what the science and data needs are to achieve the goals of the decade? Linwood, I'll take a swipe at that. This is Craig. The way we do that currently is to identify international requirements or collaborative requirements, either one government at a time or a government with a philanthropy-based organization or a government with an industrial-based organization. And we identify the scientific priority as it comes from the scientific community. Organizations like POGO, organizations like Seabed 2030, for example, in the field of ocean mapping or in the field of ocean observing. And then we work government to government. We go and find the collaborative sources of funding. So while we might inspire the individual program or project idea maker to be building an oceanographic campaign, I believe we're talking to a community that has done that before and has found success in already used pathways. This would not require a new pathway of engagement to find the sponsorship for these activities. So I, I would encourage folks to continue to rely on the, the uh, formal pathways of engagement to have a unity of voice within the science community for programs and projects and activities to be undertaken, and then to continue to rely on those funding sources and methods that you have used in the past in order to be successful. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And while I, before you go on mute again, this may also be... Um in, in your uh, area of expertise to answer. And the question is, when it comes to submitting uh, programs, projects, partnerships for decade endorsement, how will, how will this be done? Will there be forms? Will there be a portal? And when should the world expect to see calls for programs, projects, partnerships, et cetera? And if you want to pass that to IOC staff or Vladimir, please. I'll, I'll start and then I'll pass to Vladimir because much of that would certainly be under the domain and control of the IOC as the bodies that I explained earlier in the brief would take up their responsibilities. But for now, the, the proposals, I think people should be working on their organizational activities and the criteria of acceptance, for example, have to be approved by the IOC and then the UN General Assembly as part of this overall implementation plan. And I think the timing was explained earlier where that would take place for the IOC this summer and for the UN General Assembly in, in September. But in and around that time frame, I think people should be ready to start submitting and proffering their, their um, ideas. I think the unfortunate situation of this COVID-19 uh, predicament that we're in globally may slow down some people's activity, but at the same time, you may be finding time to coordinate better and quicker. So use the time well, but you still have some time to get this together. Now, I'll turn to Vladimir for the ambition and the, the um, identified practice of the IOC as it would intend to go forward. Thank you very much, Craig, and also Linwood, uh, and also for the person who asked that question. Uh, you know, uh, the approach uh, of uh, the uh, United Nations uh, uh, Special Envoy on the Ocean, Ambassador Peter Thompson, uh, about activities in the ocean uh, can be expressed by the phrase, let thousand uh, flowers bloom. Uh, 
So we would like really to opt for the diversity of, 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 of approaches. And you know, once again, I would like to emphasize that despite IOC has been in the lead of preparation for the decade, this is decade of United Nations, not an IOC decade. We are simply contributing to the process. And because of that, uh, the, the key factor of success uh, for this snowball activity would be uh, your communication. So indeed, there will be several calls for actions and uh, based on the implementation plan uh, clarifications, you will be able to formulate uh, the actions and proposed activities. And I think what is going to, uh, uh, to be achieved in the decade is the leverage of these actions. They will become suddenly more important uh, for the governments because you know they will be in the line of this big framework that is going to to turn uh, the decline uh, in the ocean health uh, in, in, into development. So that will be the approach. Yes, there will be calls, there must be some rules observed. These rules are not entirely kind of, you know, stri strict, but you know, there will be some guidelines. And with that, I think the possibilities for uh, increased funding in the right direction will be also increased. Thanks, Vladimir. We are um, approaching the end of our two hours, and so I think I'm going to stop taking questions now. The discussion has been very rich. There are many questions that we haven't gotten to. Uh, a number of you have asked, will the questions be archived? And I think they will. Is that right, Allison? Will we make these questions available to the public, or will they just be considered in the review process? Um, at this stage, we're, we're certainly going to archive them and keep them, and they will be used to to guide the the review process. So they'll be taken into account as as part of the feedback. Okay, and I'll point out that in, in addition to questions, we've received many helpful comments, including things about uh, looking at previous decades to make sure that we are benefiting from lessons learned, um, and I think a, a particularly prescient point is that there are many decades now happening simultaneously in many movements. And there are some places um, where there's simply not enough human capacity to participate in all of these decades. And this is something we need to um, take into account. Now, uh, I want to assure you that we'll go through all of these questions and they will be incorporated as part of the final review. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions again after this session. So once we're done and we've signed off, you'll receive a, a follow-up email inviting you to complete a short survey of two open questions. The first question is about the implementation plan itself. And the second is about your experience participating in this virtual session. Um, as you've heard, the plan is to have many more virtual sessions and we wanna get better and better at doing this. So your feedback is certainly appreciated. Um, just as a reminder that the slides and a recording of the session will be made available online. You've heard a number of times um, to, to make sure you register to be informed, but there's also just a wealth of information that's being um, constantly added to the Decade website. So uh, before we close, I just want to invite Vladimir, to say a couple of words to wrap us up. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn, but also for uh, very ably convening this uh, meeting. And thank you also, uh, uh, thank also our staff for organizing the meeting, uh, the panelists, you know, of course, and you listeners, and, and, and not really listeners, real participants in this field. In, in, the, in this process. You know, uh, I think the, the game was that you know, we were asking questions and we were giving answers. And it looked like to me that we knew answers to all questions. But unfortunately, this is not the case. There are so many open questions in how we can organize this huge process that would be leading in the mainstreaming of ocean science. And uh, I think we would like to invite you to continue to be involved in the decade, try to propose actions, and what is also important, uh, please try to communicate with your colleagues, uh, ask them uh, or invite them to participate in our meetings. Uh, we're inviting you to the second um, uh, session of this webinar that's going to be uh, soon. There will be, there is an announcement there. So I think communication is now 
uh, the key to success of the decade. So the decade uh, accelerates, reaches big momentum, and we are able to uh, generate meaningful proposals that will be resonating with governments, with funding agencies. So it will be helping the governments uh, and helping us to, to turn the decline of the ocean into, into, uh, into, into um, re uh, reverse the decline of the ocean. So this is the task for all of us. And if we are successful in this, the opportunities will be, I think, mighty. And this is a, an opportunity that's already created for the decade. The decade is already changing the course of action. And it's our, uh, I think, opportunity to, to use this uh, for, for uh, going further in this process. So I thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Vladimir, and, and thank you, Guillermo, Martin, Craig, and Allison. And, and as Vladimir said, thank you to everyone for your questions. Um, I'll remind you, these are very difficult questions you've asked, and it is you and, and all of us together who have to answer these questions, not the IOC and not the EPG. And, and I really think what we're seeing is that we can work together to deliver the science we need for the oceans we want. So thanks everyone, and it was great having you here, even if virtually. That's the end of our webinar, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.